Today has been a very weird day for me. Can I have this wine? Oh. Yes. Yes. Three more. No. It's been a weird day for me, a weird week. Towards the end of the week, I, uh... Have you ever got angry at God? Yeah. yeah. Wow, really? I thought I was the only one. Hmm. Um, some things went... This week was a busy week, and some things were happening, and I, I felt led by God to help this young man going through some trials and uh, possibly very negative outcomes of that and uh, so I was praying for him and then Friday morning I God got me up at four to write all these uh, verses and the stories about David and how he conquered the giant and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego how God protected them and when evil had come against them and slander and then Daniel and so I shared all these things with him, and it was uplifting and encouraging for him. And I just had this sense that God was going to do this specific thing for this man, and that we were going to rejoice in that and, and just see the victory. And, right. and then Friday about 9.30, we found out that it was totally the opposite, and that things didn't go well at all. And I just yep. was in shock. And his mother's in shock. Family's in shock. And so Saturday morning, I kind of started out a little bit in shock, and then I turned to grumpiness, and before long, I was angry at God. I just thought, what did you have me tell all this to this man for? And now I have to face him later on, and he's going to say, what about all these truths you told me, and look at where I am. I've got to sort that all out with God, but I just have to confess this morning, I didn't even want to do a sermon at all. I just didn't even want to go to church. I wanted to quit pastoring. It was so bad. I just... I just thought, God, I, I used words like doubt, and I don't know if I believe. And I mean, this, I was very frustrated with God, and so I didn't even want to do that this morning. And then I'm here tonight, and I'm better now, so I'll do the sermon. <laughs> but it bothered me, because I've been saved for 21 years, and I've never thought that way before. I've never, ever been angry at God or doubted or anything, but this rocked me to the core, and so I really struggled with it. And, and <clears throat> so I have to speak on this forgiveness thing again. Perfect timing. Um, because I almost felt like God owed me an apology for setting me up. And that's just, that's how ridiculous it can get, but maybe you've been there too. And so I'm still working on that with God, and so I just apologize. I'm not myself today. I'm not myself tonight. I'm struggling. Um, and so if it comes across kind of weird, I apologize for that. But I just want to be honest with you that guess what? I'm human. Cut me and I'll bleed. Uh, and I just really had a tough time with this, and I, I've got to get through it, and I will. But it just really hit me hard, I guess. Yeah. So we're going to review, we're going to talk about forgiveness. I don't feel like doing that right now, but we will. Uh, forgiveness, the, the forgiven debtor, we called it last week. And so this is kind of like part two. I hope you do two-part things, but it kind of worked out that way. And so... A quick review I just want to go through, and this is what rocked me this morning, because here I am, I'm mad, I'm crying, I don't like God right now, and so the definition of forgiveness, the first line is to stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense or a flaw or a mistake, cancel a debt. I shared with you last week how Corey Ten Boom uh, was standing uh, after a service that she had spoken all about forgiveness, she was the gal that spent many years in uh, Auschwitz concentration camp, survived it. But in the line was one of the guards that mocked her and sexually made gestures and whatnot as they showered naked or got de or de -loused. They would stand there and beat those guys and do all kinds of horrible things. And here he was in line. That's kind of how I feel today. I want to be angry at God and I don't want to forgive him today. And the first line I read is that I've, I've got to let go of these feelings. And it just reinforced in me how easy it is to get a feeling for someone and not want to let it go. Even though it's uncomfortable, and even though it's wrong, and even though I know I shouldn't do it, and even though I don't like to feel this way, it's almost like you don't want to release it. Like, I got hurt, and by golly, I don't want to let it go, because if I let it go, that means I forgive them. And sometimes we don't want to forgive because we've been hurt. But we talked about last week, too, that the Bible says that we must forgive, and that's the hard part. There's a Greek word in the New Testament that talks about forgiveness, and it's, I'm going to call it a, a phemi, but it's A-P-H-I-E-M-I. -E the Greek definition for uh, forgiveness is to leave, 
to send away, to desert, to abandon, even to divorce. And so as we read that, we realize that God is saying that I, I want you to leave these bad feelings of, uh, towards this person. I want you to send those bad feelings away from yourself. I want you to desert this area that you're standing in. I want you to abandon these sick feelings that you have that are tearing you apart. And I even want you to divorce yourself from them. And the only way to do that is to forgive that person. It's hard to forgive sometimes. Things happen in our lives, especially, uh, I know some of you carry things from your past, a child, whatnot, things have been done, things have happened, and so it's been a struggle to forgive. I remember sharing with you uh, about a lady that, well, I didn't know if I shared it here, but uh, she had been abused many, many years ago, and she was waiting to spit on her dad's grave, waiting for him to die so she could spit on his grave and kind of get revenge. In our short discussion, she was able to admit that, you know, that probably isn't the way to think, and that's not the way God wants me to think, but she still struggles with that. A definition of a debtor, because remember I said forgiving, forgiven debtor, a debtor is a person or institution that uh, owes money or something to someone. It's used in a moral sense, too, as, as indicating the obligation of a righteous life in which we owe to God. So God dies on the cross, and we accept Jesus Christ and that gift when he offers it to us. And when we accept that gift, we now come into this kind of binding contract. We say, because we accept that gift, and because you loved us enough to forgive us, I now am going to desire to live a righteous life as you've called me to do. And so we have that indebtedness. We're, we're in debt at some level, spiritually, to God. And I know that's a challenging statement because we've always heard that salvation is free. Salvation is free. It doesn't cost us anything. And that's true. The salvation part of it does. But once we accept that salvation, we now say that because we believe in you, Lord, we're going to live the way you want us to live. We're going to say no to some things and yes to some things. We're going to serve you in some ways. We're not going to do things bad in some ways. And Heavenly Father, you call us to forgive. And so by golly, we're going to do it. Because you tell us that we must. Now, a lot of us don't like to hear that we must do anything. In fact, a lot of times we revolt against that. We rebel against that. When you're a child, you do it because mom and dad say so. But when you get to be a teenager, you start to sometimes rebel. Remember that episode in your life? My brother decided to rebel against my dad once. Once. I remember they were in the uh, living room and dad, uh, Brad was dressed up to go somewhere. Dad said, where are you going? We're going to do this or that. And he said, no, I'm not. I'm going to town. And he said, no, you're not. You're staying here. And he said, I'm going. Boom. <laughs> Brad's on the floor. He stayed home. He changed his clothes. Now, these days, Dad would probably go to jail for that. <laughs> but you know what? It was a cause and effect. My brother learned pretty quickly that Dad meant what he said. You can't rebel that much against my dad. The Lord doesn't necessarily come and punch us, but he has desires for us. He says, I want to give you this abundant life. If you choose not to have it, if you choose to live a rebellious life and choose to not live a righteous life, you're going to show that there's going to be consequences for that behavior. But I want to give you an abundant life, and this is how you receive it, by living in the way I desire for you. I think he realizes that when we don't forgive someone, the person we're not forgiving isn't suffering, it's us. We've got this angry part of us. We've got this frustrated part of us. We have this part that feels that we've been slighted, and it's not a positive feeling. How many of you like feeling like you have unforgiveness and you love it? Man, I, man, I, I, I woke up this morning and there's 72 people that I haven't forgiven. I feel great. Maybe I'll have a V8. It's usually it's an undermining feeling and it tears you apart on the inside. Especially if you know that God says we're supposed to surrender those things. We're supposed to say that we won't. Uh, hold something against them. We're supposed to actually forgive them. And we don't. Now we're going against God himself. So we are forgiven debtors. I hope you understand what I'm saying by that. Colossians 3, uh, we'll go to that later on, but it says we must forgive even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. Now any gray area in the word must, we can try to find some, can't we? Must. Now, in today's society, they'd say, well, what does must really mean to you? Because whatever it means to you is what must is. Huh. Must means that you must do this. 
If I'm going to forgive you, and I have, then you must forgive. If you want me to forgive you, then you will forgive others. And, and uh, it's an interesting thing, but how many of us, I'm going to ask this, you don't, don't feel bad, but how many of you have someone right now in your life you need to forgive? There's quite a few hands up, isn't there? So, should we switch the sermon to something else? <laughs> yeah. No. No, it's perfect, because if we're sitting out there saying, yes, I have some people, and, and Jesus says you must, Lloyd, I'm not saying it. Jesus is saying you must. Shane, you must. So will we. I guess we don't have to. Oh, I love you, Lord Jesus, but not in that area. I'll give you most of me, but not all of me. Matthew 7, 21 to 23 says this. This is just a reminder from last week. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Okay, so just grab a hold of that for a minute. He says we must forgive, and now we read that uh, if you want to enter heaven, you have to do the will of my Father. My Father's will is that I must forgive. Like it or not? Now, if you're out there saying, I can't do it, Brian, I can't do it. I want to do it. I mean, I hate this feeling too. I've been carrying it for years, but I can't do it. Hey, that's fantastic. You're mature enough to say that. Now go to God and say, because I can't do it without you. I need you to help me do it. Because if he's going to call us to forgive, he's going to give us the power through Christ to be able to do it. And so I think you need to have a different mindset because I truly believe that most of us that won't forgive someone is because we've been hurt somehow and it's made us angry because hurt usually leads to anger, maybe even some fear because you're going to forgive that person that you feel like they get off scot-free. You hurt me, I say, it's okay, and you get off and get to do that and I'm the one that suffered. We have that mentality that we look at it and say, that just doesn't seem fair. But I want you to look at it differently. Because Christ says, to enter the kingdom of heaven, you must do what I tell you to do when I told you to forgive. Now I forgive them, Lord, not for them as much as for you and me in this relationship. Because I can do a lot more for you, a lot easier, Lord, than I can for them. So if you ask me to forgive them, I will, because you ask me to, Lord. I'm not doing it as much for them as I am for you. And now I have more peace about it. Cut them almost out of the equation. The byproduct of you following God is that they get forgiven. And if you can do that in your heart truthfully with God, then God is pleased with you. You win, win, win. They get forgiven. You no longer have this burden laying on you. And you've now pleased you God. That's not a bad deal at all. But we have to be willing to say, I can let that go. And why do we drag that stuff around with us? How many years have somebody held this against somebody? More than one year? Two years? Five years? Ten years? Fifty years? It's time to let it go. Maybe because you never knew that God required it. Or maybe because you have to come down to the point where you say, you know what, God is first in my life, so I'm going to do what God tells me to do. Not even ask me to do, tells me to do. Be obedient to our Lord. We have to be able to surrender some of these things that in all our hearts say that we have all the rights and all the reasons to feel this way. And if I told you what it was, Brian, you'd say you're justified in feeling that way. In fact, if it happened to you, Brian, you wouldn't want to forgive him either. I'd probably agree with you. But it still doesn't get us away from the point where Christ says we must forgive. Must. Anyone wonder what must means? Don't you wish it was if you feel like it? But it's not. Because Christ forgave us. We've now seen the example. Because I tell you what, he, he's going to forgive us for a heck of a lot more than we need to forgive that person for. Because we've got a lifetime of sin prior to knowing him, and even ongoing. We ask forgiveness from time to time for what we do. Even when we don't want to, we do things we need that forgiveness for. <clears throat> Last week I talked about if you won't follow God, if you won't try to live a righteous life that you're, we're saying that we're debted to, that's kind of our spiritual relationship, 
that you could be, you can hear the word repossession. If you don't pay your bills, you get repossessed, right? They repossess this or that. I won't ask if anyone's had anything repossessed or watch the shows where they sneak in at night and load up somebody's airplane or take off in a boat because they haven't made their payments. So the idea of, of repossession isn't a very good one. Here's the definition of repossession. The action of retaking possession of something, in particular, when a buyer defaults on payments. So if we choose to step apart from God, we say, you know what, God, I don't want to live the way you want me to live. I, I'm not going to forgive, forget it. I'm not going to do it. Then we can be repossessed by the person that possessed us prior to Christ. And guess who that is? We go back into the darkness in those areas because Christ says, I won't forgive you if you don't forgive them. And then remember the parable of the four soils? We read that often and we realize there's four different kinds of soil and some are better than others and whatnot, but let me just go through that really quickly. I'm just going to give you the examples. The first one is the seed by the wayside. Remember that? Some of the seed falls by the wayside. It's those who hear, but they don't even understand the word and they never sprout, they never really grow into Christ at any level. Then the second kind of soil is the seed that falls on stony places. It immediately receives it with joy. But there's no root in himself, and so tribulation, persecution comes, and he stumbles, and he dries up and falls away. It's like in a drought. Shallow rooted. Just only for a season, only for a time. As long as things are going great. If you plant something on shallow, like just above cement, let's say, a couple inches, it grows fine as long as everything's just right. As long as there's just enough water, enough shade, it doesn't get too hot, doesn't get too cold, it stays just fine. But you put heat on that thing, and it dries up in no time flat because it has no root, no way to sustain itself. And that's what happens when you're on the stony soil. You, you've got this start going on, but you can't sustain it because it's not deep enough. Too many of us don't have a deep enough relationship in Christ to sustain the difficult times. Some seeds fall amongst the thorns. It says the cares of the world, deceitfulness of riches, choke the word out. And he becomes unfruitful. It's growing. It's there. It's alive. But it's being choked out by the worries of the world. Think there's anyone sitting here tonight that is in that state? They love the Lord. They, they want to have desire of the Lord. They're here at church quite often. But all the cares of the world and the difficulties of the world or whatnot just seems to overwhelm completely. So they're still alive, but they're overshadowed by all these things of the world. Have you ever had to water a thistle? You can go by an alfalfa field that's been cut and it looks gray or brown, you know, barely anything's grown, and up pops a thistle, green as can be, deep rooted, deep rooted in bad stuff. But you don't have to water a thistle, but you've got to take care of grass. You've got to take care of the things that you want to grow that can produce fruit. The last soil, seed on good ground, it hears the word, understands it, and it bears fruit and produces a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. So what I'm saying to you is that if you're not forgiven, you've got to decide if you're like by the wayside. I don't think you are. Are you on the stony places? I don't think you are. I think you're more of those that fall among the thorns. Oh, I love you, Lord, but I'm overwhelmed by this unforgiveness. And you tell me I have to and I don't want to and I won't. Because I have this deep rooted in me. And so those things overshadow our ability to have that abundant life, to have the joy of Christ in us, to be able to forgive others. We need to be that fourth soil on the good ground. A farmer takes care of the good soil. I know that Mark Vedder does not go out and fertilize rock. Just doesn't do it. But he'll look for the best parts of his field, and those you always send to ten more because it produces more fruit. You get better volume for it. So Christ says, if you'll follow me and be the good ground, including forgiving people, because I've told you you must, you're going to produce fruit, not only for those people you forgive, not only for God himself, but for yourself in your own heart. You'll be cleaning out some of that old stuff that's been hanging on and clinging you down and chaining you from being all that God wants you to be. It's not easy. Corey Ten Boom, I was sharing about her. She sees this man and says to God, I will not forgive that man. I cannot forgive that man, God. Well, he kept coming closer and closer to give a handshake. By the time he got to her, she had already asked God for forgiveness for not wanting to forgive. Received that, had a peace about it, and was able to shake his hand. 
See, I'm in the midst of that whole struggle of God. It seems like you set me up. It seems like you had me share truths with this man, but it sent him to feel that everything was going to turn out fine, and now I've got to go face him sitting in jail and say, uh, that stuff I shared with you, it's true. I just don't know why it didn't work for you. And he's probably going to have some questions about that. So I'm in this mode of, God, I need to forgive you, but no, I don't. I need to forgive me and ask forgiveness because I even doubted you because I don't know his plan. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't know his plans. I'm thinking maybe he used me to try to encourage this man to hear what he was going to hear. I don't know yet. I'm asking for an answer so I can understand it better. But I have to ask for forgiveness from God for being angry at God and thinking he should forgive, he should come to me and ask forgiveness. Can you imagine that? How sick that is? Yet that's where I got it. I'm getting out of it, but that's where I got it. A lot of you guys raised your hands too. I'm not the only one that appears, appears to have an anger with God from time to time. First time for me, I didn't like it. It was very uncomfortable. I hope it stays that way. Let's go to Matthew 18, 21 to 35. We're going to kind of go through it a few verses at a time, but that's where we're heading. It's the, it's the unforgiving debtor. We've all heard this probably. You've had an old fat pastor preach about it from time to time. I know they have here. We're going to start with verse 21 and 22. It says, Then Peter came to him, meaning Jesus, and he said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Hmm. In my research, I was sharing that I read where rabbis often said three times. They weren't sticking with just one time. They were saying three times. And so Peter, I guess following God and seeing all the good that he had done, says, how about seven times? Would seven times be enough? Would seven times be enough? And then Jesus says to him, well, how about, how about a lot more than that? How about 70 times seven? Now, I always got to say it, it's 490 for those that are keeping track against your way. Lloyd right now is adding points. He's counting up how many he's got the Ruby. For Christmas, we'll all get those clickers. Well, Sandy, boy, when I hit 490, you're going to get it. I'll be able to feel justified to get after you. And so let's say we use that mentality. How many times has Christ needed to forgive you? Just this week. <laughs> Many. Huh? Lots. Barbara just said 3,000. Is that what he said? Oh, he coughed. <laughs> a lot. A lot. So when he says 70 times 7 and we say that's 490 times, that's a lot. We come to realize that we burn that up probably quite often in our life. I want to go to Luke 17, verses 3 and 5. It says, take heed. Take heed means pay attention to or, or take notice of this to yourselves. If your brother sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day he returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Let's take out the word shall and say you must forgive him. Your intention should be to forgive him. But the key there is he's repenting. He's saying, man, I messed up again. I'm so sorry. I'm going to try not to do that. And then he comes back and says, man, I'm so sorry I tried not to do that. How many of you have said to Christ more than once over the same thing? Man, I'm so sorry, Lord, I'm trying not to do that. Please forgive me. Thank God we have a good God. God of grace and mercy. Because it's a struggle. But what he's saying is if you've got someone that is actually coming to you saying, I have messed up again, I am so sorry, I will try not to do that anymore. You need to look at their heart and see that they mean that because they're repenting and you need to forgive them. How many of us it happens once, we're like, oh, I can tolerate that. Twice, man, three times, this is getting sickening. Yeah. It can be a struggle. God has some high standards, doesn't he? You must, you must, you must. He goes on to say in verse 5, And the apostle said to the Lord, Increase our faith. How many of you, if you realize that he, every time they come to you, you've got to, and they repent, you've got to forgive them and say, Lord, give me more faith to do this. We need to cry out, Lord, give me more faith to be able to forgive those that I don't want to forgive. 
Again, why don't we want to? It's because it's affected our flesh. It's hurt us in our flesh, not in our spirit. It's hurt our flesh. We feel like we've been tromped on or hurt or somehow someone took advantage or whatnot and we feel justified in our flesh to say, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to. I don't have to. So back to Matthew 18. I want to throw out a reminder. In society today, people are getting offended rather easily. They're growing up softer in that mode of feeling offended and very verbal about telling you how offended they are. Many, many years ago, when I was at the University of North Dakota, we had this kind of this supper for graduating and whatnot, and the three of my professor ladies were there, and they were sitting, and I came around, and I said, ladies, are you enjoying your evening? And boy, did I get it, because I called them ladies. They're women. Now, to me, that was not a big deal. I offended them, so I apologized and said I did not mean anything bad by it. Quickly walked away and went like, <laughs> Whoa. I thought ladies was a compliment, it is. but it wasn't for them. So come to realize that we can offend people very easily these days. People are they're being taught to be softer. North Dakota State University, right now because of the finals and Christmas time, the kids are stressed, so they have a room now with dogs that they can go and pet the dogs to relieve their stress during final week. We didn't have that. What we had was as much Diet Coke as I could drink <laughs> to stay awake and to study so I didn't have to be so stressed about the, the, the gradients. Things are changing, so people are feeling more offended. So I'm just saying you're going to have to talk to God and say, do I really need to run around and apologize all the time for everything I'm doing, especially if it goes against what the Bible says? Now, the Bible says to share truth, but you have to share it in a way that's not so destructive or not so harming, but you want to share the truth nonetheless. So just know that you might be told that you're offending someone by sharing truth. So you have, I guess, the choice to say, well, what do you want me to say to you? What would you like to hear? But no, I don't do that. Stick with God, but realize that there are a lot of people that are being offended easily, and there are many Christians who get offended easily too, because if we're living more in the flesh than in the spirit, we're going to be offended. We take things personal. It hurts our feelings, all these different things. But when you walk with Christ and have the Holy Spirit in you and have Christ in you, you're better able to handle those things that otherwise would cause you to feel offended or cause you to take an offense from somebody. Because we have the peace of God and we realize that that person doesn't know any better. Or a non-believer is somehow mocking me about my faith? Am I shocked or offended by that? Not at all, because he's a non-believer. What should I expect out of a non-believer when he comes to talk about Christ with me? Except to be frustrated or angry or feeling like we're pointing, you know, bad things that he's doing or whatnot. So all of a sudden I've got the grace of God and the mercy of God to realize that he doesn't know any better. Because I didn't know any better for however many years, until 1998, and I finally accepted Christ. But Christ forgave me for those things, and he calls us to forgive people for their trespasses. What's the Bible say in the Lord's Prayer? Forgive us our trespasses as... We forgive those did you just hear what you said? Yeah. Lord, forgive me my trespasses at the same level, the same equivalency that I forgive other people. Those of you that raised your hands and say, I don't forgive, I can't forgive you. That's a tough statement. But we pray that all the time. Lord, treat me like I'm treating other people. Forgive me the same exact amount that I'm forgiving other people. If that doesn't scare some of us, Christ gives us this great gift and he says to pass it on. To be Christ-like, to show love to them like I showed to you. To, to show forgiveness to them like I showed to you. Proverbs 19.11 says, The discretion of a man makes him slow to anger and his glory is to overlook a transgression. When we walk with Christ, if you get serious with Christ and you inundate yourself with Christ and allow the Holy Spirit to move in you, you're less apt to take an offense because you're at a different plane than you used to be, because you're not reacting in the flesh anymore, but in the spirit. 
Christ talks about these fruits of the Spirit, gentleness and kindness, patience, long-suffering. All those things help us to deal with someone that might offend us so much better than prior to us knowing Christ. When as soon as they came out of their mouth, you're like, bring it on. Bring it on, I'll get you someday. Oh, man. Yes. Christ can help us to slow down our transgressions. Galatians 2.20 says this, For I have been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but who lives in me? Christ. You think Christ is going to launch into a box? tirade of screaming and yelling or holding an offense forever? Nope. Remember when they came to the garden to arrest him and, and it was it Peter, I believe, that took a knife and cut off an ear of one of the guys that were coming to and Christ stops them and goes ahead and heals that ear. He's not harboring any offense there. In all the right in the world, I mean, he came into our world and look what we did to him. He should be so offended that he would say, you know what, well, I'm not forgiving them their sins. I'm not going to the cross for these yo-hos. They're a bunch of morons. But he didn't. He said, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And he went on the cross to forgive us. Now in our Bible study and discipleship class, there was a line that we read in there that said, anytime our, our walk or our life crosses paths with God's path, we need to turn and take God's path. So if I consider that arm up there my path and I'm going along and now I run into Christ's path and his way of living, I need to turn and go with Christ. So if I don't want to forgive someone, but now I've crossed paths with Christ, I, now her, you can't leave here tonight and not know that you're supposed to forgive, that you must forgive, and if you don't, he won't forgive you. Now you've got the ammunition and the power to go out and say, I need to go with God and I need to forgive that person. You can leave here now with the knowledge to know that you must do it. I'm not saying it's going to happen tonight. But so many of us never have taken the process to begin to tear down that wall of unforgiveness. We just held it up. In fact, we go get more mortar and we slap more on there. If there's a crack in it, i got to put it back on because I'm supposed to not forgive that guy because of what he did to me because it hurt me badly. Now Christ says, go ahead and get the dynamite and blast that wall out of there. You must do it. That's why you come and hear this sermon. I heard this sermon this morning and it changed my life. <laughs> Actually did. Verses 23 to 27. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. I looked up talents and some of them say it's 30 some pounds of gold or silver. It's a lot of money. It's It's huge. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had, and that payment be made. That was quite common in those days. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. This is an example of what Christ did for us. And what's so interesting is this guy says, I'll pay it all back. Have patience with me, God, and I'll pay it all back. And God said they had compassion on him and forgave him. There's no way he can pay that back. The sum is too large. The sum is too large. I did some reading about this 10,000 talents and these 100 uh, denarii. And so this guy said it's, it's up to $7 billion the talents are worth. But he said, look at it this way. Look at wages. So he said an average guy in those days uh, worked six days a week. They worked about 50 weeks out of the year. They earned 300 denarii in a year's time. So 100 denarii is four months of his wages. A third of his wages would be 100 denarii. Because later we're going to read about the man that owed 100. And so if you worked each year, you earned 300 denarii. And after 20 years, you'd have earned 6,000 denarii, he says. Okay? So we've got this pool. It sounds like a lot. But he said you'd bring that to the king and he would say at this point, congrats, you've, you've, uh, you've worked 20 years, you've got 6,000 denarii, that'll pay back one talent. 
So you only have 9999 yet to pay back. Take about 200,000 years at that rate. The point he's making is that gift that we got on that cross, we could not pay the debt for our sin. We can't work our way through it. We can't sing our way through it. We can't serve the church our way through it. We can't eat our way through it. We can't cry our way through it. We can't pray our way through it. It took Jesus Christ on that cross and his gift to us to forgive us that debt. We just have to decide how much we value that gift that we receive. If we just realize that 10,000 talents is like $7 billion in American money today, and he says, I'm going to forgive you that debt, Joey, don't worry about the $7 billion anymore. It's, it's on me. Don't worry about it. Would you be thankful? Would we live our life knowing that we were given that great a gift? The value of it. Now set aside the spiritual sense of the value to realize that we don't have to go to hell. He went on hell on that cross for us and now we have everlasting life with Him and it didn't cost us anything. It cost Him everything. It cost God His only Son to give us that gift. So we move on in this story. We realize that He, he said, I would forgive that man his debt. He'd been forgiven the debt. But verse 28 and on says, But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. We realize that's not very much money at all. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. And so his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Isn't that the same thing he just said to the king with 10,000 talent bill? Hey, just have patience with me. I'll pay you it all. It was impossible. A hundred den denarii is possible. He says the same thing. Hey, have mercy on me. I owe you this. I know it. I will pay you. Oh, but does he? And he would not, but went and threw him into prison until he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then the master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant! I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the tortures until he should pay all that was due to him. Now verse 35, I don't know if I got you at 35. So my heavenly Father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. He's saying the king forgave 10,000 talents to this man. This man who's forgiven that huge debt goes to this man that only owes him 100 denarii and won't show him any mercy whatsoever. The servants tell God, and God says, you know what? I'm not going to put you in prison. So if you won't forgive other people, then I'm going to do the same to you. You've been given such a gift. Magnify that gift through your actions. Magnify that gift and show me that you de desire that gift and that you appreciate that gift by forgiving others that come in contact with you. Because what I forgave you, my brothers and sisters, way more than this pennies that this man has offended you with. But how many of us walk around in life and won't forgive even though we've been forgiven that all? Just like the story. It's called the unforgiving debtor. He owed like crazy and was given grace and mercy to not have to owe anything. And yet, he still goes over to the next guy and grabs him by the throat and demands that he gets his money and then says, throw him in prison. He didn't pay me those hundred denarii. So if you're having trouble forgiving people, remember the gift that you've been receiving, that gift of forgiveness from God. For all our sins prior to knowing Him, and then once we accept Him, we still continue to sin, and we still can go back and ask repentance, and He continues to forgive us our sins. And now He says, what I want you to do as Christians is go out and live like I live with you, and forgive them their sin against you. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Do to me as I do to them, Lord. Is that an easier way to say it? Treat me like I'm treating them, Lord. How many of you want to say that? That's why he says you must forgive. Because he loves us enough that he does not want that we would perish. He loves us enough that he wants to give us an abundant life. So please forgive, he says. Not just please, but you must. But I want you to do that so that you can have all that I have for you. Because I love you. You need to love them. 
That's why we're called the forgiven debtors, because we've been forgiven, but yet we owe a debt to Him. How we live. Spiritual indebtedness, indebtedness is literal, but, but figuratively. When we choose to live in the flesh rather than walk in the Spirit, we fall short and become a spiritual debtor. Romans 12.1 says, and this is Paul writing, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. I gave you this huge gift that I've forgiven you all, and isn't it reasonable that you should go out then and live as I ask you to live? Because if we're willing to receive the gift, he's saying that you acknowledge that you want me, and so I'm going to share truth. Now live in that truth. It's not unreasonable for him to want that for us. And yet that's a whole other gift all itself. It should be a catalyst for us to want to forgive others. Colossians 3, 12 and 15. Talking about the character of the new man. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, meaning he, he chose us, we're the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies. You can always talk to God, he can get the size that fits you, even if you get a few pounds on you. He can put on those tender mercies. Kindness. Humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. You know it says put on your tender mercies, just like it says to put on the armor of God. I believe every day you've got to get up and say, okay, I got my tidy whities and I got my pants, I got my shirt, and I got my tender mercies to put on. Put them on. Just as if you pick up your cross every day, I think we need to put on our tender mercies every day because... Apart from God reminding us of that and us living in that, it's hard to live that life that he wants us to live. Because he says to bear with one another and forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, so you also must do. But above all things, put on love. This seems to be the key. Put on love, which is the bond of perfection. And if you have these things taking place, then it says, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts to which also you were called in one body and be thankful. If you can live as Christ wants you to live and forgive people, you're going to have that peace of God in your heart. You're going to feel better about yourself. Who cares if somehow they think they got away with something? It doesn't matter because they probably forgot what you're upset about, what you've been holding on about. Some people are still holding on to unforgiveness for somebody that passed away 20 years ago. Well, it's a little too late to go and work that out with them, but it's okay to do that with God. I release this, God. I no longer want this baggage. Why is it that we carry around bags for years of all these things that have taken place in our life? And don't you think you may be offended somewhere along the line? So there's times we need to go ask for forgiveness. We keep our mouth shut and say, well, if no one says anything, I guess it's okay. I guess kind of got away with that one, or we're just kind of throwing that one underneath the desk there, no one's going to bother. You still need to go ask for forgiveness if it's bothering you. If you were remembering it, God's maybe saying, I want you to deal with this. And maybe they need that spark from you that's a Christian to go to somebody else to begin that process of healing, to be able to talk about it, be able to work it through. But we've been called to a higher place because God has given us that higher position, and that higher position is taking the high road and not the low road. Again, Matthew 7, 21 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Later on, he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I'm going to finish with just a, a couple things that some people have written. John MacArthur wrote a couple things that are pretty profound. It's in the book called Freedom and Power of Forgiveness. If you need a freedom book targeted on that. 1998, God is the consummate forgiver, and we depend every day on his ongoing forgiveness for our sins. The least we can do is emulate his forgiveness in our dealings with other, others. So we think about every day he's willing to forgive, we come to him and ask for it. Can't we do the same for others? Forgiveness, nothing is more foreign to sinful human nature, and nothing is more characteristic of divine grace. Then Ken Sandy said this, Christians are the most forgiven people in the world. Therefore, we should be the most forgiving people in the world. Because we realize the gift that we've been given. So a lot of musts and shalls and 
You know, forgive me as, as I forgive other people. And you know what, Lord, examine my heart. If I'm not holding, if I'm holding unforgiveness for them, I guess I'm asking you to then not forgive me. That's how that's how detailed that is. But yet we can go to the and ask forgiveness. We can go and give forgiveness, and God will forgive us. We've been given a great gift of forgiveness. I guess as we come to the season, we're reminded of that. But this time of year, it's pretty, we don't seem to have to forgive as much. It seems like everyone's in a good mood. No one's stepping on our toes until you get to the, the you know, family reunion and the meal. There's somebody who irritates you. But talk to God. If you need to forgive, talk to God. He has the power. The Bible again says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Tell him, I don't have the strength to do it on my own. And he will pat you on the back and say, son, daughter, I know you don't. But you've come to where you can receive it. And he'll help you walk through that process and you'll have victory with that person, but more or less victory with Christ. Look at it as a relationship. My relationship with Christ needs to be repaired and improved. It's not so much about that person. They may not give you what you're looking for. I'm sorry, man. I just want to let you know I forgive you. For what? Well, that day you offended me. When did I offend you? See, it might not work out so good. Go to God. And then go and say, I forgive you because God asked me to. And see where it goes from there. Bow your heads, close your eyes. Heavenly Father, throughout the day you have worked on me about this idea of forgiveness. I had to preach this to myself this morning. And Lord, I do ask for forgiveness for doubting you, questioning you. I don't understand it all, and I may be not supposed to understand it all. But I do pray that you'll help me, Lord, because, Lord, I want to understand the whole process so it's easier for me to deal with. But Heavenly Father... I need to ask your forgiveness for how I thought and how I felt. Now, Heavenly Father, I pray for everyone sitting out here tonight, Lord, that you would give them the ability to forgive. I saw hands go up, Lord. Let that be their homework, is to go to you, Lord, and say, I now realize that I must do it. Now help me to do it. Heavenly Father, I pray that I would ask next week or the week after there would be less hands up because people have dealt with these things. We ask that you would bind Satan and holding them back from doing so riling up old feelings, reminding them of the bad things, and Heavenly Father, remind them of the good things, the relationship with you. So Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and the glory, and Heavenly Father, continue to work in our lives. Help us to see and hear what you're saying, in order that we can live that out in our lives, that you would be in our life, you would be leading our lives. We ask that in the precious name of Jesus, everybody said. Amen. Again, Christmas Eve service will be at 5 o'clock. Uh, if you want to come for that, we'll